All right, this is one of the biggest lectures, both long and dense, that we have. So take frequent breaks. Chapter 12 is the central nervous system, and therefore it's a very big chapter. This is part A. And I gave myself a blank sheet because I'm going to draw a little bit for you. Okay. Um, when you were an embryo, at some point you looked kind of like this. And... Um, if you were this embryo, yes, you had a tail. No, not your ancestors. You personally had a tail. Yes, you, you had what uh, looked like gill slits. Uh, it looked like you were going to make gills. And then your genes uh, sort of uh, morphed that into something else. That's actually one of the reasons why I have tonsils. But if we take this embryo that we're looking at, and kind of orient it for us. Uh, the left side of this embryo is what's is what's um, sort of aimed at us. We're looking at the left side of this embryo, so it's laying on its tummy. Okay, so this would be ventrum. This would be dorsum, and this would be left. So we can't see right. Right is uh, sort of into the screen. Okay. And we're going to, um, like mad scientists, we're gonna we're gonna actually cut this embryo, okay? And somehow the embryo is gonna be okay. Let that part go, <laughs> okay? If we took a cross section through a human embryo, actually technically uh, younger than the one that we're looking at. in my um, sort of tadpole-ish drawing. Okay, pretty early on, oh boy, I just pressed the funny button. We'd have a tube running through us. It wouldn't act as an alimentary canal yet, but that is its fate or destiny. Okay, and again, allow this to be ventrum and this to be dorsum, okay? And if you need it to, to, to be, this can be left and this can be right, okay? I don't think that's necessary, but, but it's there for you just in case you need it, okay? Well, pretty soon, I'm just gonna change colors just so you can see what I'm doing, okay? Pretty soon, uh, along our developmental pathway, not our evolutionary pathway, but our personal, individual developmental pathway, so we all did this, along the length of our dorsal body wall, we experienced an invagination. Unfortunately, notability won't let me make subtle changes. Rude. <laughs> an invagination, an in pocketing. Okay? And this pocket got bigger. Wow, I really can't make changes that you can see. So I'm just going to draw that again. Ugh. Rude. So ignore the, the fact that my circles are very different sizes. Okay, uh, that that in pocket got, got bigger, um, deeper, okay, and even started to pinch off. Kind of like a multicellular endocytosis, okay? Such that 
eventually, as an embryo, each of us ended up reforming our intact dorsal body wall. Okay. And establishing a cylinder dorsally located okay from that invagination it's a hollow cylinder and it runs along the entire length of the embryo okay and, and actually the embryo is younger than, than uh, this one that I drew Okay, that tube is called the dorsal because it's dorsally located, hollow because it's a cylinder, not a rod, or it's a tube, sort of, um, not a rod, okay? nerve cord and every member of our phylum um, makes one as an embryo. Dorsal hollow nerve cord. Well, it's this, this tube of early neural tissue that will differentiate into the central nervous system. The spinal cord, the cerebrum, the cerebellum, the brainstem, all of that derives from this tube. Okay? And that's what we're alluding to in this first typed slide, which is slide number two, okay? Neural tube and dorsal hollow nerve cord are the same thing. Right? And what I drew, if this is the tadpole-ish embryo, maybe we're looking now down upon the dorsum and using our x-ray vision to see into, into that embryo, then this tube here, that is the dorsal hall and nerve cord. Okay. It actually looks like it's full of something, doesn't it? Yeah, actually pay attention to that. Notice the, that blue stuff, okay? Because it's going to become relevant, all right? Well, pretty soon, time goes on, right? We develop more and more as embryos. Pretty soon, that nerve cord starts to differentiate, starts to kind of pinch and morph. And we have, early on, a forebrain, an area of the dorsal hollow nerve cord called the forebrain, an area called the midbrain, an area called the hindbrain, and then everything else will eventually differentiate into spinal cord. All right, let's let a little more time go by. That forebrain will pinch and morph to give rise to two regions, the telencephalon and the diencephalon. The midbrain will pinch and morph and grow to give rise to, yay, it's still called the midbrain. <laughs> and again, the difference between these two is just time, the passage of time. This is an older embryo than this is. The hindbrain will differentiate into two regions, the metencephalon and the myelencephalon. Okay. Well, we need to keep 
growing. It's the telencephalon that gives rise to the cerebrum. The telencephalon gives rise to the cerebrum. Good news is, even as adults, we still feature a region called the diencephalon, so we don't have to rename that. The diencephalon includes the epithalamus, we'll talk about it later, the thalamus, we'll talk about it later, the hypothalamus, we'll talk about it later, and somewhat counterintuitively, the retina. So part of the diencephalon projects forward during embryological development to give rise to uh, the, the, the sort of innermost surface of your eyeball. Very cool. Midbrain gives rise to midbrain. No, no change there except for a little bit of growth, okay? We don't have to change the name. Yay. The metencephalon will differentiate into the two regions, pons, which is part of your brain stem, and cerebellum. Telencephalon gives rise to cerebrum. Metencephalon gives rise to cerebellum. Don't get those confused. Another portion of our brain stem is the medulla or medulla oblongata, and that derives from the myelencephalon. Myelencephalon. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, here's that, I think that's the same image, isn't it? Yeah, there's the same image showing that early embryonic telencephalon giving rise to cerebrum. Okay, there's that early diencephalon. It's gonna look different as we age, but we keep that region and it includes the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the epithalamus, and the retina. Midbrain is still midbrain, and midbrain is one of the regions of your brain stem. Metencephalon gives rise to pons, another part of your brain stem, and the cerebellum, which is not part of your brain stem. Myelencephalon differentiates into medulla or medulla oblongata. Hey, why are these three things color-coded green? What does green mean? Oh, yeah, brainstem. These are the three regions in a fully differentiated brainstem. Midbrain, pons, and medulla, right? And then the rest of that dorsal hollow nerve cord will differentiate into spinal cord, okay? Now, we still haven't answered, answered the question or addressed the, the region that includes this blue stuff. It's not literally blue, it's just color coded so that we can see it. Okay, so that's gonna come back to haunt us still, still. And that's where we're going in the very next slide. Okay. This is gonna take some imagination on your part, definitely, because we're, we're looking at something that's very, very flat, all right? Hopefully I'll remember when I'm actually video recording this to show you a more 3D version. But um, actually, no, 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 sorry. I will, will show you automatically a 3D version, or I do show you automatically a 3D version in um, the brain slash brain stem walkthrough. Okay, so that's gonna give you a lot of uh, 3D support for this chapter. Uh, it helps prepare you for practicum two, but it also really helps you with this, this chapter. So it also, in that sense, helps to prepare you for exam three. Should have mentioned that to begin with. Anywho, um, I don't know about you, but I kind of see a ram where this is one of the horns specifically the left horn of that male sheep. And this is the other horn, specifically the right horn of that male sheep, okay? 
in order to see this kind of sheep-like horn pattern, we have to use our x-ray x-ray vision. So we're not just looking into uh, the skull, we're looking into sort of the um, filling, if you will, of, of the, the cerebrum. So these are spaces, these are spaces that sit inside your cerebrum, okay? And the two that I just outlined, the ram's horns, those are called lateral ventricles. You have two of them, left and right. Okay. They are connected via really shallow channels that are even shorter than what this illustration suggests to another chamber, another hollow chamber, also embedded in your cerebrum called the third ventricle, the third ventricle, okay? The third ventricle is, and I'm gonna change colors just so you can see the, the very slight difference, is actually we need a color we can see. Eh. Maybe like that, okay? It's connected through a longer channel to another hollow region called the fourth ventricle. That's the fourth ventricle. Okay. There's the third ventricle. And here are your lateral ventricles. This channel is the cerebral aqueduct, okay? And then very nice and straight, heading, oh my God, what a mess I'm making. Heading down your spinal cord, your entire, entire spinal cord, central canal, central canal. Okay, these are all hollow spaces in your central nervous system, okay? So imagine somebody put blue jello into those spaces. They would look like these shapes or the, those, those um, that jello uh, form, I should say, uh, would look like these shapes, okay? In reality, what's filling these spaces is cerebrospinal fluid. And in fact, these spaces are lined with ependymal cells. So these are kind of like the birthplaces of cerebrospinal fluid. And we'll see them again and again and again. So we'll come back to them, faux show. In the next slide, in the next slide, the, the color coding that we saw in uh, slide six, it's maintained. So um, all of this green stuff, for instance, will give rise to the various regions of the brain stem. Okay, and therefore represents um, the midbrain, the metencephalon, the myelencephalon. Okay, this. Uh, at least initial tan stuff, represents telencephalon, so it's gonna give rise to the cerebrum. This purple stuff here represents diencephalon, okay? This red stuff represents metencephalon, specifically the portion of the metencephalon that will give rise to the cerebellum, okay? Well, this is, early, uh, young embryo, okay, or fetus. Let time go by, we're still a fetus, okay? But notice the telencephalon has greatly enlarged and is also rotating backward. And that's how it's, it ends up enveloping the diencephalon. In fact, um, if, your, if your cerebrum was um, 
my gosh, this is a horrible analogy. <laughs> Uh, well, actually, let's let's use something different then. If your cerebrum was an avocado, <laughs> okay, the pit of that avocado would be your diencephalon. It sits right smack dab in the center of what you've been calling brain, okay? Not only does the telencephalon get big, 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 big and rotate back, 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 it ends up such that it ends up uh, enveloping the diencephalon. It also ends up enveloping the midbrain and a good portion of the pons. So it envelops part, at least, of the brainstem, okay? And it gets so big inside a limited container. What is that, that container that's already established that is limited in size? It's the skull, okay? And, and the relatively small size of the skull compared to, to the rapid uh, expansion of the, the telencephalon into the cerebrum forces the surface of the cerebrum to become highly folded. That's why it's so folded. Because we grow super, super fast and we wanna really maximize the amount of surface area that our brains have to offer. Look at all these folds. Okay, so that folding lets us pack more into that small space. All right, next slide, there's the done deal, right? We're using our X-ray, X-ray vision to peekaboo lateral view at the telencephalon which kind of looks like a bird kind of kind of kind of um, if I if I really um, force this to to do what I want it to do to look like a bird there's the beak and maybe here's the waddle on the turkey or the chicken blah, 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 blah. and this would be an eye if that were a bird you're going to see a bird eventually so that's why I'm kind of forcing you to see it now diencephalon all right this extra extra highly folded region back here there's your cerebellum cerebellum and then this is midbrain this is pons, this is medulla. And who's this guy? Yeah, that's your spinal cord. Good, good. Next slide. We already learned in chapter 11 that gray matter represents oodles and oodles and oodles of neuron parts that are not myelinated. Well, which parts of neurons are not myelinated? Or which parts of neurons are never myelinated? How about that? Yeah, gray matter represents cell bodies or somae. Okay, white matter, why is it so pale? Why is it, why is it that we refer to it as white matter? Yeah, because it includes oodles and oodles and oodles of neurons, many of which, not all, many of which are myelinated. Well, which part of a neuron may be myelinated? Yeah, axons. Okay, hopefully a review. <laughs> hopefully old news, okay. Well, the arrangement of gray matter and white matter through the central nervous system isn't the same as we look at different portions. It's actually gonna kind of flippity flop. So if we go to the next slide, right? And we're actually gonna work our way up, more or less. If 
when you take a cross section through the spinal cord, okay, it does depend on where along the spinal cord we take that transverse section, but more or less, we're going to end up with an oval, okay? And the oval will either have what looks like a letter H, depending on where we take that cut, or maybe a little less H and a little more butterfly. It's still the same general shape, okay? And yes, this particular butterfly has a wing that, that's trilobed. I see that too, that's okay. It's not incorrect. But it's still kind of like a weirdly shaped H. You guys kind of see that? All right, well, that is gray matter. Notice that the gray matter in the spinal cord is completely surrounded by white matter. And all of the gray matter is interconnected. Let's move up the spinal cord. And now we're looking at a cross section through the brain stem. Okay. Specifically, we're kind of on the transition between pons and medulla. So this is kind of like lower or inferior, more so inferior uh, brain stem. This isn't midbrain. Okay. Whoa, look at all this. There's something that looks like candy corn. That's gray matter. These little dudes are gray matter. Oh my gosh, look at this. That's gray matter. Look at this thing over here too. That's gray matter. That's gray matter. This stuff is gray matter. Good grief. Oh, this is gray matter. This is gray matter. Look at all this. It's, it's like islands of gray matter, kind of, in a sea of, of white matter. In fact, there's even some gray matter not so clumped together here. Okay? That's, that's very different. Not, not all of this gray matter is interconnected in cross-section. All right, let's climb up into the cerebrum. Next slide. The direction of this section, the plane of this glass is different, it's perpendicular, but it still gives us uh, an appreciation for how gray and white matter are arranged in the cerebrum. Look at this. There's like a crust. of gray matter. So what's most exposed is gray matter. We didn't see that in the brainstem. We didn't see that in the spinal cord. That's very, very different. Can I stop tracing this? Thank you. <laughs> that crust, and I'm previewing, is called cerebral cortex. Okay, but look, whoa, there are also still, like what we saw in the brain stem, islands of gray matter. Okay, you guys, are you ready? In the central nervous system. In general, in general. What are islands of gray matter called? Think about it. What are clumps of gray matter or clusters of gray matter called? Yeah, nuclei. These are all nuclei. All of these. And if we back up one slide, to look at the brainstem again? Yeah, these are all nuclei. 
wrong with this stuff? And yes, someone has bothered to name each nucleus. And just a reminder, I'm going to write it on the slide this way, but it's, this is going to be confusing later. Um, from chapter 11. English is dumb. <laughs> Actually, let me rephrase that. I mean, English is dumb. I don't want to rephrase that part. I'm pretty convinced of that. A cell's nucleus is not the same thing as a nucleus we would find. Oh, God. in the central nervous system. Heck, a nucleus in the central nervous system, in this context, is many cells. Okay? Whereas a nucleus only ever belongs to one cell, except in the case of fungi sometimes, but we don't need to know that. <laughs> okay, hey, look at this space. Look at that space right there. What is that? Oh, here's another one. Like right at the heart of the of the cerebrum. What it, what is that? Yeah, those are the lateral ventricles. Yeah, good. Good. All right. So the point is, very different arrangement of gray matter and white matter, depending on where we are in the central nervous system. Now, slide 14, let's talk in more detail about ventricles, the ventricular system, um, all of those sort of um, hollow containers that we saw in that light blue sort of x-ray x -ray vision kind of, kind of setup. Again, we have two lateral ventricles, okay? They're C-shaped, okay? Well, actually, there are lots of C-shaped features within the cerebrum. And one of the reasons why we see that pattern again and again and again, not just in ventricles, is that the ventricles are sort of in the way. They kind of, they kind of force other structures to take on the same shape, okay? The two ventricles are divided by a super thin wall called the septum pellucidum. And I'm gonna go, actually, I'll, I'll point it out later. I'll point it out later. Each lateral ventricle is connected separately to the third ventricle via the shortest, shortest, shortest ever little canal called the interventricular foramen. Super short, super short. The third ventricle is actually buried within the, the diencephalon. So it's, it's within the cerebrum and then also further buried inside the diencephalon. The third ventricle is connected to the fourth ventricle via a longer, more conspicuous canal, not so dinky like the interreticular foramina, um, called the cerebral aqueduct. And your fourth ventricle lies in what was embryologically your hindbrain. Okay. It's more or less sitting between your pons and your cerebellum. And it has three openings, openings, two lateral apertures, and one median aperture, okay? These openings allow the contents of the fourth ventricle to enter the space 
immediately surrounding the cerebrum. And it's a little early to introduce this, but that space is called the subarachnoid space. All right. Not only is um, the lumen of the fourth ventricle continuous with the subarachnoid space, it's also continuous with the central canal. Okay. Now, in the next slide, we get an anterior view and a lateral view via x-ray x -ray vision of that ventricular system. Okay, there's our ram's horn Okay, where this portion is closer to us. Now it's headed into the screen, but because it's the letter C, this is again right here where I just put this X. Here, I'll put it in red, right here. This is now close to us again. It's a C. It's wrapping around. Okay, whereas here, super thin, the wall between them, septum pellucidum. And we'll be able to see that in a, a sagittal section of the brain. So we'll be able to point that out later. Super short, never gonna be able to point it out in a, in a sagittal section. The interventricular foramina Here's our third ventricle. Here's our cerebral aqueduct. Here's our fourth ventricle. It kind of looks like a kite or a diamond with four sides. Oh, ta -da! All right, and then this little opening and this little opening, those are the lateral apertures, okay? Wait, wasn't there a third opening? Yeah, there was a median aperture. However, there's central canal. In order to see that median aperture, I have to turn my head, <laughs> okay? Now, oh wow. Oh wow, that, that C, that letter C is, well, a very interesting font. <laughs> and huge, right? Really expansive. That's impressive. Here, really overemphasized. In fact, let me get in there with some red. So this beep, that's an interventricular foramen, okay? And then do you guys see what I see? I see a bird. Here's the bird's eye. <laughs> Here's the bird's beak. Do you guys see it now? Oh, no wonder the diencephalon looks kind of like a bird's head because inside the diencephalon, is this shape sort of insisting that everything surrounding it looks like a bird? Very cool. There's your third ventricle here. And yeah, x-ray vision, I guess this is x-ray, x-ray, x-ray vision here, cerebral aqueduct, okay, where is Here, fourth ventricle. Here's our left lateral aperture. And then do you see this little boop, 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 boop? That's the technical term for it. Boop, 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 boop. That's the median aperture. Oh, it's smack dab in the middle on the back. So if I was gonna use my extra, extra, 
fix my vision, it would be more or less here. Just in case uh, you didn't notice I'm over on the anterior side. Oh good, and, I, and I'm making a mess. <laughs> a very big mess. I would be here, ish. See, you can't see that color either. Is that a little bit better? Okay. And then here, going on and on and on, central canal. And again, um, you can get a better feel for like the 3D arrangement of all of this by watching the brain plus brainstem walkthrough. Okay, next slide. Recall that the cerebrum is forced to fold highly, highly fold because the container that it's growing within is limited in size. Well, yay! The folds have names, <laughs> okay? Notice I've got, I'm, I'm over here by the way. Notice I've got crevice, crevice, or groove, groove, oh, here's a nice big groove. Actually, I shouldn't, I shouldn't uh, spend that since you're gonna need to look at it later. Oh yeah, look at all these crevices and grooves, okay? Whereas, I'm changing colors. This is a ridge coming out toward me. This is a ridge coming out toward me. Here's a ridge. Here's a ridge. Here's a ridge. Okay. The ridges are called gyri, or each one is a gyrus. Some of the grooves are very deep and some of the grooves are not so deep. Shallow grooves are called sulky, or singular is sulcus, and some of the sulky that we need to know include the central sulcus and the lateral sulcus. I'll point those out in a hot second. Whereas, when grooves are really, really deep, they're called fissures fissures, and some of the fissures that we need to know include the longitudinal fissure and the transverse fissure. In this image, bottom, here's a groove, here's another groove. You know what, I could work a lot faster if I just chose a nice thick font. Okay. Presumably this represents what? Yeah, a sulcus. Whereas this represents what? Yeah, a fissure. Okay. Just a question of depth. All right, let's change colors yet again. All right, here, where I've applied a dotted yellow line, I'm sorry, a dotted white line, good grief, is the same sulcus as this one, where I've applied that dotted white <laughs> line. Okay, that's the central sulcus. 
the central sulcus. And a lot of people have already heard of the lobes, or at least most of the lobes of the cerebrum. And um, you, believe it or not, have heard of the lobes because the lobes are named after the bone under which they lie. Therefore, this guy here, and don't worry, we'll see this again in a, in a subsequent slide. That's the frontal lobe, and this is the parietal lobe, okay? What helps to separate frontal from parietal? Yeah, the central sulcus, the central sulcus, okay? Whereas, and I'm going to go over this with red, or maybe I'll just supplement it with red. See this dotted white line that I made that I'm now supplementing with a red dashed line? That is the lateral sulcus. It helps to differentiate, well not differentiate, uh, demarcate. Temporal lobe from the others, okay? Okay, I'm gonna change colors. Uh, what should I do? This is obnoxious, so by all means. <laughs> all right, hopefully you see that I'm applying green just to help accentuate that dashed white line. Well, that's a really deep groove, the one I just traced with those green dots. That's the longitudinal fissure. And now I'm gonna trace this one. That's the transverse fissure. Okay, are there other fissures? Uh-huh, yes, uh-huh, yes, definitely. <laughs> Are there other sulci? Oh, oh my gosh, yes, yes, yes. We're just uh, getting the ball rolling, <laughs> okay? And um, even though everybody has a central sulcus, a lateral sulcus, a longitudinal fissure, a transverse fissure, some of our, our grooves are not predictable. So you and I, may have a, a, um, some slight differences in the folding of our cerebrums. And therefore, uh, it's, it, it only makes sense for us as a &P students to study the folds that are predictable, that are, that are the same from one person to the next. Next slide. Okay. We just previewed this, so this should be a breeze. But it also hopefully just makes sense. Here's one of your two frontal lobes. Why two? Why two? Well, because your cerebrum is comprised of two hemispheres. There's one hemisphere. There is the other hemisphere. Just two huge chunks. And we're spending a lobe to describe these chunks. So we call those big, big chunks hemispheres. Here's one of two parietal lobes. There's one of two occipital lobes. Here's one of two temporal lobes. What's this thing? Good, that's the cerebellum. 
Excellent. Now, most people have actually heard of those um, as lobes, but certainly you guys have heard of them at least as bones, right? Um, but most people, even those that, that have a little experience with uh, central nervous system, they're not familiar with the uh, insular lobes, or each one can be called an insula. And that's because the insular lobe is kind of buried, so I'm kind of hugging it right now. And go hug the other one. And down here. I'm going to apply another color just so you can see it again. Hugging. Hugging. Okay, kind of buried. That lateral sulcus that divides frontal and temporal lobes ends up so highly folded that it obscures an underlying peekaboo. Peekaboo. That's the insula. This in particular is our left insula, the one that's being revealed via these tongs. Oops. Insula, okay? Now, one thing one thing that you need to be careful about is that already we have dedicated our focus to the cerebral cortex, the cerebral cortex. If we're talking about gyri, if we're talking about sulky, if we're talking about fissures, if we're talking about lobes, then really we're just talking about that gray matter crust, all right? So technically, this here, depending on where this cross se section was taken, but because I can see the lateral sulcus, I can infer this and this. These are the frontal lobes. Notice that I'm just putting my mark on gray matter on that crust-like gray matter. This and this, temporal lobes here and here, insular lobes. Okay, so typically lobes are only relevant for the cortex. All right, remember just a couple slides ago, we met this sulcus here. That's the central sulcus, okay? Well, the gyri on either side of the central sulcus have really good names. We're gonna be fine. Look, this one, is called the pre, before, central gyrus. Ah, I can handle that. And this one is not surprisingly called the post central gyrus. Wow, this class is so easy. <laughs> All right, next slide. Okay, speaking of the cerebral cortex, the cerebral cortex is Again, very crust-like, and the reason why I choose that word is because it's so thin. It's so thin. It's it's anywhere from two to four, so two, three, four-ish millimeters in thickness, which is absolutely, oh God, this is gonna be the worst pun ever. Mind-blowing. <laughs> because It's just in that thin, thin layer. It's just in those few millimeters where you do things like think and plan. That's crazy. <laughs> That's the, wow. Wow. That's
that's where so many of your cerebral cell bodies are. Where else can we find cerebral cell bodies? Oh, good, in nuclei. Very good, in nuclei. Good. Happy Tessa. All right. The cerebral cortex, sure, it's divided into lobes, but it's also divided into three kind of more general functional areas. There's a whole neighborhood that's motor and function. There's a whole neighborhood that's sensory and function. And there's a whole neighborhood that we call association. <laughs> we have motor areas, sensor, sensory areas, and association areas. Okay. Now, some weird words. The cortex of each hemisphere has a contralateral relationship with your body. The cortex of each hemisphere, left and right, has a contralateral relationship with the rest of your body. So, for instance, the cortex of your right hemisphere is receiving sensory input from the left side of your body. It's sending out motor plans to effectors on the left side of your body. And vice versa for the cortex of your left hemisphere. Contralateral. Okay. Unfortunately, I'm sorry about this word. Humans do feature some lateralization. <laughs> Oh, English, English, Oy. boy. In other words, um, our two hem hemispheres are not absolutely identical. They're darn close. They're darn close. In fact, there isn't a lot of strong evidence that the concept of left-brained and right-brained is legit there, there isn't there isn't a lot of evidence that that supports that one side of your brain is more logical or one side of your brain is more spatial or one side of your brain is more artsy so stop spreading lies <laughs> what is lateralized often handedness right-handed, left-handed, okay? And definitely language. Now, that doesn't mean that only one hemisphere is involved in language. They're both involved in language. But our chief language centers, our chief language centers are housed in our left hemisphere. Even if we're left-handed. Isn't that surprising? Yeah. So the the language centers that help us um, process speech that we're hearing or reading or seeing, I'm thinking sign language, would be in our left hemisphere. The areas that help us um, form speech or write or sign would be in our left hemisphere. Does that mean right hemisphere doesn't participate? No, it does participate. It's just not sort of the language leader. Language left, easy. Language left. All right, next slide, please. The motor areas, the motor areas, thankfully, are all found in the cortex of your frontal lobe or the frontal lobe region of your cortex, if you want to put it that way. You have a primary motor cortex. You have a premotor cortex, and they are going to haunt you forever. 
We're going to come back to these and 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 back to these. And it's going to seem like I will not shut up about them because I won't. We have a Broca's area and we have a frontal eye field. And those two, we don't have to spend a ton of time on. Next slide. Where are these things? I'm zooming in. Okay, so. Um, we might say, oh, look at that house. Oh, look at that house on 3033 Fulton Avenue. Have we described who lives in that house? No. Have we described what goes on inside that house? No. So, keeping that in mind, what is the name of this house right here? What is the name of this house? Don't read the slide, think. Oh, very good, you guys. Yes, that's the pre-central gyrus, okay? Now, answer this question. Who lives in that house? Or what is going on inside that house? Oh, that's where the primary motor cortex is housed. Had I not told you that and pointed at the same place and called it two separate things, you'd probably be thrown for a loop. Hey, what goes on roughly through this kind of almost T-shaped area? Who lives here? Yeah, the pre-motor cortex, the pre-motor cortex. And the pre-motor motor, motor <laughs> cortex also kind of surrounds the frontal eye field. Right next door is Broca's area. All of these are motor. Motor. Hopefully we already, we already associate the idea of motor with efferent. Hopefully we already associate the idea of motor with sending a plan What is the plan for a response out to effectors or an effector? Okay, next slide. Oh, by the way, your book, well, actually, I'll bring it up later. It'll be fine. I'll bring it up automatically. Okay, oh my gosh. Do you see this Dr. Seuss Christmas tree? Do you kind of remember seeing this? I do. It was at the very end of 11A. I said, hey, some multipolar neurons might look like this. And in fact, if you see this pattern again, it will help you if you can remember pyramidal. That's a pyramidal cell. That's a, just a really big multipolar neuron that kind of looks like a Christmas tree with antlers. Okay. Well, the neurons that we're going to find in the primary motor cortex are primarily these pyramidal cells. And pyramidal cells have really, really really long axons. Those axons, because they're so long, you could probably infer, do you think they're going to be myelinated? Yeah, I think so too. Okay. Those, of course, are going to extend beyond the cortex, 
through the white matter of the cerebrum and even, because they're so long, travel down the spinal cord in some cases. Wow, that's impressive. That's impressive. Well, your primary motor cortex has a slightly different idea of what your body looks like than you do. <laughs> it has a slightly different idea of what your body looks like than you do, okay? In other words, your primary motor cortex has its own private map for your, for your body. I'm gonna show you that map. It's just gonna freak you out, but everything's gonna be okay. Okay, hey, I only want you to look at this side of the slide. Pretend this side doesn't exist. That's why it's all uh, faded out, okay? So if we're looking along the, the um, pre-central gyrus, okay? And we're examining what's going on map-wise for your primary motor cortex. This part of your primary motor cortex is concerned with sending motor plans out to your feet. This part, maybe your butt, okay? A lot of this region, a much bigger region, your fingers. Why? Because you can tell your fingers to do separate things, right? Look how big your your primary motor cortex seems to think your tongue is or your lips. <laughs> okay? The more innervated an effector or effectors in a region, the more primary motor cortex will be committed to that region. But the layout of, of motor neurons with respect to your body, it's almost upside down. Isn't that weird? It looks creepy too. Okay, next slide please, which is 24, just so you know. Premotor cortex. Your premotor cortex is also in your, in your uh, frontal lobe, but it sits just anterior to your precentral gyrus. So this would be premotor cortex, okay? This would be, actually let's, let's use a different, a different notation. Primary motor cortex. Okay, that, that little notation of one with a degree symbol, that means primary, whereas uh, two with a degree symbol would be secondary. Maybe you've seen that before. It's just shorthand. Anywho, here, as of this slide, now we get to sort of differentiate. What, what are the premier motor cortex and the primary motor cortex, what are they each doing? How are they different, okay? Well, the premotor cortex comes up with the plan. That's its job. It comes up with the plan. However, its plan is a draft. It's like a proposal. Here's the, the plan that I propose we, we endeavor to pursue, okay? Here's the plan. Your premotor cortex does not, does not directly relay that motor plan out to your effectors, okay? Two things have to happen. We gotta go visit the editors to make a final draft. The editors are better informed as to what's going on outside the body and, and inside the body for that matter and can therefore fine tune this drafted motor plan, okay? And then, and then the motor plan has to go to the place in the cortex that actually sends 
that motor plan out that actually mm, delivers. If you like that better, deliver. Okay. Well, what part of the cerebral cortex is that delivery guy? It's the primary motor cortex. Okay. It's the primary motor cortex. Who are the editors? We'll find out. <laughs> we'll come back to it. I promise. I promise. It's, it's, it's almost impossible to organize a chapter about the central nervous system in an orderly way. <laughs> so it's going to feel like we're hopping around a lot. All right, let's talk about Broca's area and frontal eye field, those other motor areas. Broca's area, again, is roughly here, okay? But it is a language center, so I'm expecting to find it in which hemisphere? Yeah, the left hemisphere. Actually, I don't know why I wrote that since it's already on the slide. The left hemisphere, good, okay? And it is a motor area, so does it interpret speech or does it plan speech? Yeah, it plans speech, right? Hey, tongue. Curl. Hey, tongue. Thin out. Hey, tongue. Click. But is probably also involved with activities that are near speech, like writing typing, singing, signing, is that in sign language? Okay. Your frontal eye field, your frontal eye field, remember it's kind of buried in your pre-motor cortex and it sits superior to your Broca's area. It helps to uh, uh, propose the motor plans for your voluntary eye movements. In other words, motor plans for your extrinsic eye muscles, which we talked about somewhere. I think I introduced them in the muscle chapter. Okay. Now, are there other motor areas? Sure. These are the four that are, that are arguably uh, the most important, these are the four that are arguably the most predictable, okay? There's so much we don't know about the brain that it's going to feel, in some cases, like we're skimming. All right, now let's talk about sensory areas. We just talked about motor areas. Now let's talk about sensory areas. And don't worry, we're going to come back to all of this, and we're going to apply it. Okay, sensory areas, again, we're in the, the cerebral cortex, okay, are numerous. In fact, there are more sensor, sensory areas than what's represented on the slide currently. And you need to know more than what's represented on the slide currently. For each sensory area, we have a primary cortex and an association cortex. So, for instance, we have, in general, a somatosensory area. Or, I guess I should say, we have, in general, somatosensory areas, okay? A primary somatosensory cortex and a somatosensory association cortex. Visual areas, we have a primary visual cortex. Oh boy, why am I using my own handwriting tonight that you can't possibly read? I need to fake it.
We have a primary visual cortex and a visual association cortex. The auditory areas. Oh, we have a primary auditory cortex. And good. An auditory auditory, sorry. Association cortex. I'm running out of room. This says gustatory cortex, but sure enough, we have a primary gustatory cortex and a gustatory association cortex. This says visceral sensory area, but it's really visceral sensory areas because we have a primary visceral sensory cortex. Or if you said primary and visceral cortex, I would understand what that meant. And a visceral association cortex. Hey, guess what? We have a primary vestibular cortex and a vestibular association cortex. Hey, guess what? We have a primary olfactory cortex and an olfactory association cortex. Get it? So for every sensor area, <clears throat> We've got a primary chunk and an association chunk, all right? Now, let's figure out what these words mean. Olfactory, smell. Vestibular, balance. Visceral, honey, you know that one. Having to do with organs, internal organs. deep organs, if you like. Gustatory, I'm gonna leave it blank and we're gonna see if you can figure it out. Auditory. Hearing, visual, duh, sight, okay? And then somatosensory, general sensory receptors. Okay, so I'm thinking skin. I'm thinking joints. This is stuff we talked about in conjunction with chapter five. Okay, did you figure out what gustatory was yet? Oh yeah, taste, good. Okay. So for each of these, we have to know, oh, there's a vision, um, a primary and there's an association chunk, okay? And we have to know where to find them. So we're gonna, we're gonna find some of them now. So next slide, next slide. All right, now we're looking at the stuff that's color-coded blue, all right? Oops. Hey. What's the name of this house? That's the post central gyrus. Who lives there? Who lives there? Oh, that's where the primary somatosensory cortex is. That's where the primary somatosensory cortex is. You know what's kind of nice? 
you know how you have to remember pre motor cortex and primary motor cortex and now because they're abbreviated the same way you can't keep them straight <laughs> look at this on either side of the central sulcus is something primary anteriorly there's a primary motor cortex the delivery guy the one that actually emits final drafted motor plans and posterior to the central gyrus is the primary somatosensory cortex okay so the central sulcus is a primary sandwich how about that Sitting posterior to the primary somatosensory cortex is the somatosensory association cortex. Okay, we'll come back to this one. It's not, not well labeled here. Sitting uh, here. and we'll, we'll fine tune where this is in another view as well, is the primary visual cortex and sitting anterior to that is the visual association area. So your vision areas are located in your occipital lobes, but your somatosensory areas are located in your parietal lobes. Okay. Sitting I'm gonna use a bright color so you can see what I'm doing. Here is your primary auditory cortex, okay? And sitting posterior to that in that light blue is your auditory association area. Which lobe houses your auditory areas? Yeah, temporal. Well, that makes sense. Where Where is your external acoustic meatus? Where is your internal acoustic meatus? They're bone markings of your temporal bone. <laughs> yeah, okay. Now, yes, I, I have not yet labeled lots of areas. I totally agree. I'm coming back to it. In slide... 27, we're gonna address the primary somatosensory cortex. Where does it live? The postcentral gyrus, specifically of the parietal lobe, okay? It's receiving input information from general sensory receptors, okay? Those that come from the joints, those that come from skeletal muscles and tendons are helping our central nervous system to understand where we are in space. What is our position? And knowing where we are in space, what is our current position, is actually helpful for editing motor plans. For instance, if the premotor cortex were to propose that I walk forward five steps, the editors in my central nervous system might say, whoa, 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 honey, <laughs> whoa, there is dog poop just three steps in front of you. Or there is a big puddle three steps in front of you. Or there is a cliff three steps in front of you. Let's modify the plan so that you can still traverse, but not traverse through dog poop or a puddle or death. <laughs> we'll come back to it. <laughs> Now, 
remember how the primary motor cortex had that kind of weird um, distorted <laughs> map of your body? Look, your primary somatosensory cortex is also really distorted. So for instance, uh, and this is a strange way to put it, but hopefully it'll make sense. Look how big your somatosensory cortex, your primary somatosensory cortex thinks your foot is. Well, think about it. Don't you need to know when your feet are cold? Don't you need to know when you've stepped on a tack or a Lego? Yeah, and then look at this, how scary is this? Look how relatively small, isn't that crazy? Yeah, look how relatively small your primary somatosensory cortex thinks your genitalia are. Look how huge your fingers seem to be, or how huge your tongue seems to be, or your lips. Why? Because there are a lot of sensory nerve endings in these regions. I know it looks weird. I know. Okay, let's move to the somatosensory association cortex. It sits just posterior to the primary somatosensory cortex, okay? And if we can figure out what this does, then you know what? All of the sensory areas are gonna be really easy. Really, really easy. What the somatosensory association cortex does is it receives information not, not from the sensory pathway, not directly from the afferent pathway, but directly from the primary somatosensory cortex, okay? So in other words, primary somatosensory cortex is receiving but it doesn't do anything with what it receives except for forwarding it, shuttle, shuttling it along to the somatosensory association cortex where that new information is compared with previous somatosensory experiences to give that new somatosensory information context. Isn't that cool? In fact, that's what all of the sensory association areas do. They compare new input with previous experiences of that kind. If you can get that down right now, then hey, that's not so bad. That is not so bad. All right. Let's move to the next slide, which is 31. Two visual areas, of course, a primary visual cortex and a visual association area. What's the job of the primary visual cortex? To receive visual sensory input. It is receiving. It is receiving. Now, we're seeing a different view. This is a sagittal view. We haven't seen this yet or before. And it turns out that in the sagittal view, we can better appreciate, oh, that primary visual cortex is actually straddling pretty important sulcus. That's right. Here's the next sulcus on our list. It's the calcarine sulcus. The calcarine sulcus. Okay, and there's lots of other stuff here that we're going to label later. Don't worry about the other shapes that you're seeing. Okay. Straddling our primary visual cortex, so here, here, okay, 
that's where our visual association cortex or visual association area I, one's fine is housed okay what does your visual association area do it compares new visual input with previous visual experiences to give that new input context meaning so cool i love it all right next slide okay prepare to get tripped out if someone has damage just to their primary visual cortex then their eyes may be totally healthy their photoreceptors may be totally functional but they will not be able to see they'll be experiencing functional blindness Whoa. okay let's say someone has damage just to their visual association cortex their eyes are healthy their photoreceptors work they're not functionally blind what can they not do they can't apply meaning to what they're seeing and understanding those homeostatic imbalances sometimes really helps function of those visual areas if not all of the, the sensory areas click a little bit all right next slide auditory areas primary auditory cortex auditory association cortex or area i don't care <clears throat> sorry usually i take lots of breaks i haven't taken a break in an hour and a half um primary auditory cortex again is here beep okay sitting adjacent therefore to the lateral sulcus okay and sitting in the temporal lobes all right it's so receiving information auditory information and passing it along to the auditory association area which is the surrounding area also in the temporal lobe okay what does the auditory association area do it compares this new auditory information with previous auditory experiences all right next slide your book unfortunately doesn't doesn't um help much <laughs> with finding your gustatory areas your visceral areas and your vestibular areas so i had to add a few slides there which lobe are we looking at if we had to get out forks or tongs which lobe are we looking at yeah these sensory areas are housed in the insula or the insular lobe they're both the same thing either one's fine they're housed in the insula okay i'm going to move you to the next slide okay not only do i need you to know that they're housed in the insula but i would like for you to know how what what order they're housed in and you can actually remember that by thinking about what kind of vibes you'd like do you like bad vibes i don't like bad vibes me i like goo vibes that's right i like goo vibes goo vibes do you do you see it you guys goo vibes of these three sensory areas which is most anterior gustatory which is most posterior vestibular how do you know that goo vibes <laughs> goo vibes <laughs> all right we have a 
primary gustatory cortex, what does it do? It receives gustatory input. We have a gustatory association area or gustatory association cortex, I don't care. What does it do? It compares new gustatory input with previous gustatory experiences. We have a primary visceral cortex. What does it do? It receives new visceral input. We have a visceral association cortex. What does it do? It compares that new visceral information with previous visceral experiences so that you can say, oh man, it's another tummy ache. Not, oh man, I must be dying because I don't know what's wrong with me. We have a primary vestibular cortex. What does it do? It receives sensory input. Which sensory input? Input about balance. So even more information about where we are in space. Okay. We have a vestibular association cortex. What does it do? It compares new vestibular input with previous vestibular experiences. All right, here's another, I'm sorry, I'm on the next slide. 36, I think, 37, somewhere in there. Um, one, I think one, yeah, one uh, sensory area that I haven't, I haven't, uh, pointed out yet, I haven't mapped for you yet, is the olfactory cortex, the, the olfactory areas, okay? And they, notice that this is a, a mid sagittal section, they are housed in this thing that kind of looks, it kind of looks like an embryo all curled up. This thing? until I get involved and then it starts looking like the letter P, taking a nap. Um, <laughs> that's the uncus, that, 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 uh, um, that house is called uncus. Who lives there? Yeah, the olfactory areas. We have a primary olfactory cortex. What does it do? I know you want me to shut up. No, I won't. I have to beat it into you. It receives new olfactory input. We have an olfactory association area also housed in the uncus. What does it do? It compares new olfactory information with previous olfactory experiences. Okay. And hopefully you notice that, that uh, this lobe here is the temporal lobe. Okay, next slide. Now, just now we covered the, well, first motor areas, then sensory areas. Now we're moving on to the multimodal association areas. The multimodal association areas, which are so important because they take all of that information from specific sensory association cortices and combine it to make a big picture. They will combine the information about, ooh, this chair is comfy. And oh my goodness, that was an explosion that I saw and heard and mmm, popcorn, but ooh, the perfume on the lady next to me, boy. And integrate it all together to inform me that I am watching a movie at a movie theater. Multimodal association areas integrate all of the information from separate sensory association cortices. Okay. Now, by the time you take exam three, you will need to be able to march me through cerebral cortex, 
from input to ultimately output. Okay. And for that matter, we should ultimately be able to link aspects of the peripheral nervous system into our list. And that's what this crazy red staircase is starting, starting to do, okay? We know that on one end, one end of our nervous system pathway, we have sensory receptors. And on the other end, we have effectors. We know that because Tessa started drawing it in the very first week of the quarter. We know that for every type of sensation, we have a specialized neighborhood of the cerebral cortex that specializes, I just said specialized three times, <laughs> in that particular flavor, if you will, of sensation. We have a primary visual cortex. We have a primary somatosensory cortex. We have a primary olfactory cortex, so on and so forth, okay? We know that from there, that information will be relayed to the matching association cortex. Don't worry, we're gonna walk through this more than once. From there, that specific association cortex will send its information to be integrated with other sensory association cortices to multimodal association areas. Multimodal association, association oh my gosh. <laughs> association areas give us the big picture and it's with all of that information that multimodal association cortices inform the premotor cortex here are all the stimuli here's everything to consider before you make a plan the premotor cortex makes a plan and it actually sends that plan to editors first. Editors do not like to deal with the delivery guy, and so editors are gonna send the final draft back to the premotor cortex. Don't worry, we will do this again and again. And then premotor cortex sends the final draft to the primary motor cortex. Primary motor cortex sends that final drafted motor plan out ultimately to effectors. Okay, once we know who the editors are, we'll do this list again much more carefully and cleanly. Okay, I promise. For now, let's find out who the multimodal association areas are. There are three of them, main, 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 multimodal association areas, an anterior association area, which goes by another name that we'll find out soon, uh, posterior association area, and the limbic association area. Okay, and in this image that we've seen time and time again on slide 38, red we already think of as motor, blue we already think of as sensory, but this bubblegum pink Anything that's bubblegum pink, that's multimodal association, okay? Multimodal association. And this big chunk here, that's posterior association cortex or area. And this big chunk here in the frontal lobe, that's anterior. Let's talk about anterior first. The anterior association area is called, also called the prefrontal, oh my gosh, <laughs> the prefrontal cortex. I don't care which term you use, 
So if you if if you typed prefrontal cortex on an exam, that's fine. I don't care. That's fine. I get it. Or if you prefer anterior association area, that's fine. I get it. Okay. These are major integration areas. Okay. But this particular multimodal region is concerned with intelligence, cognition, understanding, uh, recall, your sense of personality, your judgment, your reasoning, your motivation even, okay? And it is therefore very much um, sculpted by your social experiences. Your posterior association area. Oh, did I already say this? Hold on, let's go back to prefrontal cortex. Um, where is this located? In the frontal lobes. Just in the frontal lobes, okay? Whereas, next slide, sorry. Um, the posterior association area has overlap with temporal lobes, parietal lobes, and occipital lobes. It's kind of all over the place. Well, almost all over the place, all right? And it is more so concerned with helping you recognize patterns. And since you're taking a very hardcore biology course, I suspect that you enjoy or are talented at recognizing patterns. <laughs> okay. Um, for that matter, our posterior association area, area also uh, gives us some context, some interpretation as to where we are in space. Okay. Buried within your posterior association area is a specialized multimodal area called the Wernicke's, Wernicke's area. It's, it's very similar to Brokaw's, okay, in that it's typically in your left hemisphere, and it is associated with language, okay? It is associated with language, but because our bubblegum pink areas help us to interpret. You can probably infer Wernicke's area is less concerned with forming speech and more concerned with understanding it. Understanding it. And, and also for that matter, um, applying like um, Yeah, I guess this is probably the best way to put it anyway. Yeah, the rules of grammar. So like diction and, and pace. Fascinating. All right, next slide is 41. All right, let's say that just, just the anterior association area is damaged. Somehow. As you might infer that's likely to cause mental issues and even personality issues. So uh, potentially loss of judgment, uh, potentially loss of inhibition, and potentially loss of attentiveness. And someone with a damaged anterior association area may seem at least or feel to be um, oblivious to what they should and should not do in certain social settings. They may even be less concerned with their own hygiene. Let's say someone has damage just to their posterior association area which presents in a, such a fascinating way. If someone has damage to their posterior associ association area, they're likely to have difficulty associating half of their body with themselves. 
<laughs> and that may surface as a reluctance to wash or clothe or care for that side of the body. So, like, they might stop cutting the nails on that side of the body. They might stop washing that side of the body. They might not bother with sock and shoe on that side of the body. Why? Because that doesn't belong to them. Isn't that fascinating? I love this stuff. All right. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a, a tool that will help you uh, in the rest of the chapter. Later, too, is what I mean. Whenever you hear or see limbic, oh, I can't snap. I have a bandaid on. There it is. That's not my best. Is that my best snapper? No. Oh, I guess I can't snap. Okay, anyway. <laughs> whenever, whenever you hear or see limbic, I want you to think emotion. Emotion, emotion, emotion. Okay. Where is the house? for your limbic association area. It's actually kind of everywhere. So this ridge here, not surprisingly, C-shaped. What forces it into that C-shape? Lateral ventricles. And a diencephalon being in the way. Okay. That's yet another gyrus. That's the cingulate gyrus. The cingulate gyrus. Whereas this guy was calcarine gyrus. I'm sorry, sulcus. Calcarine sulcus. My bad. Boy. Naughty, naughty. All right, here's another gyrus. Through here. That's the parahippocampal gyrus. And then... Your book, unfortunately, doesn't have all three in the same place. So I had to cut. <sighs> I, had to <laughs> I had to cut an image of the hippocampus out and scale it to this, this particular image. So right about where the head of the, the uncus is here, that's the hippocampus, okay? So all three of these are the general neighborhood where we're expecting to find the limbic association area. And it helps to apply or um, uh, I guess apply is a fine word, like, like a, an emotional meaning or an emotional impact to what we're experiencing, um, an emotional impact to our, our newest sensory inputs. Okay, remember we talked about lateralization, how it's, it's, actually, it's actually not, not well supported that um, half of our brain is more artsy or half of our brain is more spatial or logic based. Um, however, handedness is reliably lateralized. There are very few people who are born ambidextrous, able to use both hands equally. Um, and language, of course, is lateralized. Okay? So that, that slide we really already took care of. Okay, I'm on slide 44. And I can't see you, but I can hear you in my mind. <laughs> this is what just happened to you. <gasps> Okay, so this is unfortunately what your book does. So you know how um, throughout this lecture, every time we see like a new topic, like here are the motor areas or here are the sensory areas or here are the multimodal areas, I will, I will point just those parts out. Your book doesn't do that. Your book puts it all in one place. Can you imagine if I had presented all of this information in one place? That would be a nightmare. However, once you feel like you're ready to, to label, oh, look at the next slide. Look at that. Oh, mm -hmm. all right. <laughs> slide, I think, do I want to go there yet? 
Yes, I do. 46. Okay, we're going to start talking about um, white matter, okay? And don't worry, I haven't forgotten, I haven't forgotten about gray matter in the form of nuclei, okay? And I haven't forgotten about, hey, we're going to come back to this whole editor's idea, I promise, okay? The white matter of the cerebrum is mostly made up of three different kinds of tracts. And hopefully tract is old news. That just means a bundle of axons in the central nervous system, okay? Some of these tracts are association fibers. Some of these are commissural fibers. Some of these are projection fibers. Association fibers span from one region of the cerebral cortex to another region of the cerebral cortex in the same hemisphere. Commissural fibers span from one hemisphere, the, the cerebral cortex of one hemisphere, to the cerebral cortex of the other hemisphere. Projection fibers span from cerebral cortex to diencephalon or editors or even the spinal cord. So from cerebrum beyond to beyond. Okay, next slide please. Here we're given an illustration and a photograph. And the illustration, the hot pink lines represent association fibers. All right, we're jumping from one part of the cerebral cortex to another part in the same hemisphere. And just to drive that home, I'm gonna trace one of those Come on, buddy. There we go. Okay. All right. Commissural fibers link cerebral cortex of one hemisphere to cerebral cortex of the other. And projection fibers link cerebral cortex to other parts of the central nervous system. Which of these three is likely to be longest? Yes, projection fibers. Can you name a particular type of neuron whose axons are likely projection fibers? Who had really long neurons or axons, I should say, that, that extended uh, even down through the spinal cord. Do you remember Dr. Seuss antlers? Yeah, pyramidal cells, pyramidal cells, very good. All right, next slide, same idea. For some reason, the color changed from hot pink to red, but I'm all about consistency. <laughs> Okay, from one hemisphere to the very same hemisphere. Whereas in this view, in this sagittal view, our commissural fibers would just look like dots because they're in cross section. They're either coming out of the screen toward you or they're going into the screen away from you from one hemisphere to the other. And then these guys they have a long way to go, potentially. And, and they can go further than that. 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 Good times? Okay. Next slide, please, 49. All right. The commissural fibers are actually found in three neighborhoods. 
I think we were using we what color were we just using green, green, green. Hello. Okay. Do you guys see? Let me actually get this to be pretty fine. Kind of a semicircle right here. And then over here, <clears throat> pardon me, another semicircle just facing the other way. Do you see those? Those are relatively small bundles of commissural fibers. This one's called the anterior commissure. This one's called the posterior commissure. Okay? Whereas this thing, oops. which is shaped like a lateral ventricle, but isn't lateral ventricle. And I'll try to remember to drive that home for you in just a second. This is a huge, huge bridge of millions of commissural axons called corpus callosum. Corpus callosum, huge. Okay, while well, memory serves. See this right here? That is septum pellucidum. And again, the walkthrough will probably help with these. At least that's my intention. <laughs> All right, okay, next slide, please. All right, hey. In the cerebrum, there are lots of nuclei. However, not all of them are well understood. And so we are only going to um, focus on basal nuclei. Basal nuclei. Okay? Not only that, we're not even going to learn all of the basal nuclei because not all of the basal nuclei are well understood. We're just gonna learn those that are, that are well understood, okay? And those that we're gonna learn include the caudate nucleus, the putamen, I know, I think it's funny too, and globus pallidus, okay? These guys, together with the cerebellum are da, 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 the editors da 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 ba da ba ba da ba 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 Okay, next slide. You will need to be able to point them out. The caudate nucleus is pretty large and not surprisingly C-shaped. <laughs> this guy, that's shaped like this because it's forced to by its neighbor, lateral ventricle. Okay, that's caudate nucleus. And I actually remember that C-shaped because it starts with a C, okay? This guy here, putamen, and then deep to that, uh, you actually can't see it right now. So you'd have to use your X-ray, X-ray vision. So deep to this would be globus pallidus, okay? Even deeper to that is um, part of the diencephalon. So this purple stuff that you're seeing back here, that's diencephalon. Okay. If you go to the next slide, now you can see how globus pallidus sits just deep to the larger, more superficial putamen. Okay. 
what is confusing about this image though it's not wrong it's just it's just confusing initially is because the caudate nucleus is c-shaped here's the head of the caudate nucleus okay but most of the body of the caudate nucleus has been chopped off it was coming out of the screen toward you wrapping around and going back into the screen away from you and that's why this little tiny pink floater is sitting there. Uh, these are color-coded pink, by the way. <laughs> They're not literally pink. <laughs> okay, so both of these belong to one caudate nucleus, and all of our basal nuclei are paired, so sure enough, here's caudate nucleus, here's putamen, here's globus pallidus, okay? And then the purple stuff, of course, is um, diencephalon okay and what's nice is that even the lateral ventricles are shown okay hey i have a question if i draw a line right there what does that represent oh, very good yes the septum pellucidum very good okay we're going to go to the next line which is blank i'm, I'm aware okay and we're going to practice we're going to integrate okay all right uh what's an uncommon name for you oh, okay we'll do ebenezer <laughs> ebenezer here's my stomach growl maybe you guys just did ebenezer here's my stomach growl okay which sensor receptors are responsible for simply detecting the sound. Yeah, auditory receptors. Great, okay. That input is gonna travel, yes, along the peripheral nervous system, sensory avenue, sensory division, okay and ultimately to the cerebral cortex. Which part of the cerebral cortex is it going to first? Very good. Primary, auditory cortex, which hopefully remembers in the, excuse me, temporal lobe. All right, where is that information going next? Good. Auditory. Association. Cortex. Fantastic. All right, what's our next stop? <laughs> it just turned into a train station, I think. Yeah, multimodal. The many multimodal association areas. Okay, great. Giving us the whole picture. Now that we have the whole picture, where are we headed? speak at the same time. <sighs> Premotor cortex. Okay, now be very careful. You're now officially better educated. Where are we going next? Premotor cortex just made a rough draft. A draft motor plan. Where are we going next? <gasps> editors, very good. Who are the editors? Nice. Basal nuclei and good cerebellum. And we'll 
figure out what the cerebellum specific job is later. Okay. Basal nuclei and cerebellum, they fine tune. They polish off the motor plan and they generate a final draft. Where does that final draft go? This is a tough one. Yeah, it goes right back to the premotor cortex. Okay, now that we have a final draft of our motor plan, where are we going next? Oh, very good. Yeah, the primary motor cortex. Good. And then, yeah, out along the peripheral nervous system, specifically motor division, and ultimately to effectors. Okay? You want to be able to do that. Make that list. Okay? No matter what sensory input I give you.